And at this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Daniel Cooper. And Daniel is with Empire Valuation Consultants, a company that, again, I think they were at their first intergenerational estate planning conference as a sponsor. And Chuck Coyne, Daniel's partner, has been a speaker for all of those years. Daniel is filling in today, and he is one of the senior managers at Empire Valuation. And he has more than 15 years of valuation experience. He is particularly an expert on ESOPs, and he's been engaged in various ESOP trust, by ESOP trustees to work on transactions range, ranging from 1 million to 200 million. And today, Daniel is going to work us through the ideas of valuation as they apply to Phantom's Nest. Daniel. So good morning to everybody. Happy Veterans Day. I'm here to talk about the valuation of Phantom's Nest. So let's dig in. Here we go. Uh, so we've all heard about what Naomi is trying to achieve and what is worth remembering about uh, the presentation that Karen and Teresa gave was that there's gonna be a recapitalization. So there's really a, um, a thrust here to get the 98% that doesn't have voting rights into the trust and the, the, the strategy being discussed is, hey, let's sell it into the trust. And, you know, that's the point in time where, you know, Empire gets a call and we, you know, we fire up our computer because in order to facilitate that as a bona fide transaction, which is, you know, a great point that, that Karen has made throughout this uh, case study, it has to take place at fair market value. So some of you, put your hand up if you're familiar with Revenue Ruling 5960, if you've seen a little bit of it, okay? So some hands are going up, so that's the important thing here. So we, we come in and we establish what fair market value is. Um, and then what's the urgency here? Why, why now to get a valuation for Naomi? Well, Phantom's Nest is still relatively small, right? It's uh, less than $20 million in revenue, but it's doing very well. Uh, Naomi can wait. So she's, she's willing to hang out in the business for a couple more years. And that means that some of the factors that allow her to efficiently transfer the majority of her you know, economic value in this entity are, you know, the stars are aligning, so to speak, that the value of the firm can be discounted to reflect the nature of the interest that's being transferred and because it's the company isn't going to be sold imminently what we're essentially saying is that that 98 percent is is uh subject to a discount for lack of marketability some other options that you know are on the table for naomi in the context of phantom's nest are hey you know the case study mentions she got a ppp loan of a million dollars company is scheduled to grow in 2022. So the likelihood is that, that that money is beyond what the company actually needs. So she could take it off the table, distribute it to herself, and then there are other strategies that present themselves once that money moves from Phantom's Nest balance sheet to her own personal balance sheet. So um, moving on from there, I'd like to talk about well, now we've got the scope of work, which is, um, you know, valuing 98%, a 98% non-voting interest in Phantom's Nest. You know, what's next? How does Empire take, you know, that project that's on our docket and turn it into a valuation report that would withstand IRS scrutiny? And, um, you know, our professional standards, um, you know, both kind of revenue ruling 5960, which we've chatted about a little bit, and also, um, you know, the, the US PAP, um, ask us to look at, uh, you know, three main approaches, and we'll discuss them all in the context of these slides, but the two most important ones for Phantom's Nest are really um, the market approach and the income approach. So the income approach kind of really lends itself to Phantom's Nest because you know, the fact pattern here is company has made a little bit of money in 2021, 
uh, about a million dollars of profit on you know, 20 million in revenue, which isn't a lot of profit for a software company. I mean, you think about Microsoft, um, you know, Oracle, big, big software companies like that, you read their public financials and they're making 30, 40, 50% margins. So this company is investing for its growth, but it's likely to take off. So looking historically at the company, you may not be able to really get to, all right, this is the income base for the future. Naomi probably has projections. You know, Empire would take those projections, look at the cash flows employed in the projections. And then really the key thing to convert those cash flows into a value of the firm is a discount rate. And you know, why should Naomi do the valuation now? I mean, it's a question about you know, all of the planning strategies that you know, the team behind us is, is throwing out there. Well, why now? Why don't you wait a year? You could always wait a year. Maybe it's a better time in a year. I think we are universally agreed that there's some urgency to what Naomi needs to do. And in the context of Empire's work, where Phantom's Nest stands right now, well, it's, it's, it's still quite a risky bet. You're looking at a company that's just started to make money. Yes, it's got these hockey stick projections, but can it realize them? Perhaps, but it's not a slam dunk. So the discount rate that we would apply is much higher as a result of those considerations. And that's a win for Naomi because what she is trying to accomplish and how we're trying to help Lou um, and Karen to raise her out is get the lowest defensible value for the 98% of Phantom's Nest that's being transferred. You know, and why is that important in the context of the broader conversation? Well, the lower that defensible value is, um, we've set the, you know, we've set the, 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 the place where any appreciation beyond that value to when the firm is sold is, is outside of Naomi's estate. So what we're trying to look at here is the factors that cause us to do it now and get a defensible product that can help Naomi with her estate planning um, objectives. The second approach in this context, and this would more likely be on the side, not you know, as prominent as the income approach, would be a market approach. And that's to look at, okay, well, are there other transactions? Are there other revenue multiples, perhaps, that we could apply to the uh, financial metrics of Phantom's Nest to get to a firm value? One thing in the fact pattern that you guys may have noticed is that um, there were some indications of interest from several private equity buyers or several uh, buyers, perhaps even in the industry. Now, those would need to be factored into Empire's work. However, they can be put to one side, um, at least to an extent, if they are representative of um, you know, a strategic buyer. So there might be someone coming in who's in the same industry, could radically change the cost structure of Phantom's Nest, and is willing to pay a lot more for that company than um, you know, it's worth to a willing buyer and a willing seller without any of those um, synergies factored in. And, and that's something that, um, you know, if, if you read Revenue Ruling 5960, as we all do at Empire, we keep coming back to that not only at the firm level do you have to look at a willing buyer and a willing seller, but you have to look at, you know, with the security being valued, what would someone pay for that, given perhaps some of the limitations surrounding the security? So uh, it's a good segue in terms of, um, well, okay, we've come up with the value of the firm. I don't know, let's say it's $30 million. Um, she is giving up a 98% economic interest. So is it simple as saying, okay, the 98% is worth $29.5 million or $29 million. And the good news for Naomi as a taxpayer is it's not. There, if, if the operating agreement is structured properly and um, you know, working with the team behind us, uh, it, it certainly will be, 
Um, there are clear justifications for discount for lack of marketability. Now, if you owned 100% of Phantom's Nest, um, you could go out there and find a buyer for it. In fact, Naomi has people, um, you know, ringing her up every day, every other day to, to, to put offers on the table. However, if you owned a 98% non-voting interest, which is what we're discussing here, you don't have that ability. You are um, at the mercy of the people who own the 2% controlling interest who get to decide on really the key factors in corporate governance, whether the company decides to sell itself, whether it decides to pay distributions, all of the things that you really care about as the holder of a membership interest, you know, if you sit within that non-voting group, you are uh, frozen out. So um, even though you're 98% of the pie, um, you are very limited in what you can accomplish and therefore, you know, the, um, the precedent and all of the valuation, you know, theory and studies that go into this type of work um, are agreed and clear that you can take um, a discount for lack of marketability. And those discounts, you know, on average, they range 25 to 35%. So you're looking at an interest that you know, top line, we said $30 million. Um, pro rata, call it $29.5 million. If you're able to take another 30% off there, suddenly what was nearly $30 million is down to $20 million, which is significant um, for, you know, the, getting that lowest possible value into, into the trust. And then, you know, beyond just like the, the general concept of the BLAM, um, Doing it now while Phantom's Nest is small, you know, allows you to get a higher discount for lack of marketability than you otherwise would have received. Um, we look at restricted stock studies and companies that are small that they enjoy higher discounts for lack of marketability. The other factor that's key and <clears throat> you know places the urgency behind it, um, Naomi's in her late 50s. Perhaps she works till 64, 65, and then looks to sell or transfer the company. Um, having that window of several years between now, when she's getting the valuation from Empire and making um, this sale to the trust of the 98%, and that future point in time, the future exit, very critical. Because if the fact pattern were different and she was you know, telling her advisors, well, I'm only in this for another 18 months. I'm sure I'll get a private equity offer that really makes me happy at the end of 2023. That presents a problem because it's A, it's an audit risk. And then just when you're thinking about what you would pay for that 98%, if you know that you're gonna get your money out pro rata in a year and a half, that, that interest suddenly becomes more valuable than it would be if you had to wait five years for any money and then that's still subject to uncertainty. So just a lot of factors to say, yes, let's do it now um, for, for, for the you know, ability to justify a higher discount. And then, you know, broader picture here, Phantom's Nest growing very quickly. Lou mentioned, hey, it could be a $100 million company, $200 million company, $300 million company. Yeah, let's do it now. They're about to hit a real kind of ramp up in their growth and come back to, you know, this team in a year or two. And, you know, the 20 million is off the table but for the 98% interest. It might be 2x that, 3x that. So um, strike while the opportunities are, are the greatest. Uh, I mean, Teresa did a very good job talking about the recapitalization. I think I've mentioned that this is important to drive the discounts um, at the kind of subject security level. What's also um, nice about doing the recapitalization is that there's data to support a further discount. Um, so you're able to reduce the value of the non-voting securities by about 5% lower than the voting securities. Um, does anybody here own 
like Google stock or Facebook stock. Yeah, so you, you, you guys may well own a non-voting share in those companies. I think they have both classes listed and the data there supports that, hey, the voting shares are worth a few percent more than the non-voting shares. And the, the reason that, you know, I'll keep talking about the data and the, um, the market metrics is that that's what allows us to succeed with the IRS. When we come to make the arguments about well, why did you pick a discount for lack of marketability of X percent? The more market-based data we, we can point to, the more successful we are in defending our positions. And, um, you know, Empire has been around for 30 years, been through countless sort of IRS, um, you know, order processes, uh, you know, myself included. And we are successful because we rely on this type of data to um, to inform you know the discounts we're taking on behalf of the taxpayer. So moving beyond um, the valuation of the ninety eight percent, we've we've gotten to you know that number. It's been documented in a report. Um, it helps like facilitate. Um, what what is going into the trust and what's being sold it you know that value will drive the interest payment on the note um, so say it's a 20 million dollar note and afr long-term afr at the time the you know transaction is crystallized is two percent you'd be looking at um you know approximately forty thousand dollars of, of of interest a year on so, sorry $400,000 of interest a year on the 20 million uh, note. Uh, so that said, like, um, what can she do with her liquidity that's on the company's balance sheet and move that into a personal balance sheet so that she can take advantages of, of some other valuation discounts and uh, strategies that um, benefit her and benefit her goals that she's trying to accomplish. The one million is worth, uh, you know, chatting about. If she drops that down from the company as a distribution um, into, you know, the eight hundred thousand dollars of liquid assets that you'll currently see out there, she's up to one point eight million. You know, at which point um, she may talk to, you know, wealth managers and say, well, what should my portfolio look like? And at that point, she would be. Um, looking at the 1.8 million, perhaps thinking, okay, I've got an investment portfolio, um, but I want this, some of this investment portfolio to benefit, you know, the next generation. But I, if, I, if I gift the securities directly, um, you know, I have to use up 100 cents on the dollar of my, my gift tax credit to get those securities down to uh, Jason or Julie. So, you know, a strategy that, you know, Empire helps out with is to look at LLCs, or, uh, sometimes called family limited partnerships, um, when, when that's the structure, but more often LLCs nowadays, whereby the assets are contributed by Naomi into an LLC that is initially 100% owned by her. Subsequent to that, Naomi gifts a minority position in that entity to Julie, for instance. Now, it's a, you can initially ask the question, well, it sounds like a lot of paperwork, what's in it for her? Um, and that would be driven by, well, how would Empire value that LLC? And then how would Empire value the, call it a 30% interest in that LLC that Naomi decided to transfer to Julie. Let's keep it simple. Hey, there's stocks and bonds in the LLC. Um, maybe she did 1.4 million of the 1.8, 50-50 between equities and fixed income. Pretty easy to come up with a market value of those. Your, your brokerage statement will just, um, you know, give you that 
top level value and that you know we call that the asset approach and then that top level value of, of the 1.4 million that's from your latest account statement is the adjusted book value. That is not necessarily the value of the 30% interest that Naomi is about to give to Julie. So one of the discounts that you know is supportable is you can discount by asset class um, because you own a minority position in those assets that is you know less you have less control over their disposition over the back and forth so you can um, look at you know especially public equities um, as you know being something that you may be able to get what's called a, <clears throat> a discount for lack of control um, of approximately five to ten percent initially on the public equities for, for fixed income it tends to be a bit lower um, then you you can take one step further than that because you're giving away a 30 percent interest that does not have the ability to um, cause any of the 1.4 million to be sold and then paid out to that 30 percent interest and again is at the um, is subject to what the other 70% wants to do, you can at that point say, well, the 30% um, interest is, is not worth 30% of 1.4 million um, or you know, um, $420,000. It's worth less than that because you know, there's no market to sell this um, stake of this you know Naomi's LLC to somebody else you don't know when the distributions are going to come you don't know when the underlying assets are going to be sold and you're just you are um, powerless so you can take further discounts from that pro rata value and our experience has been that um, you may be able to get a discount of between 25 and 35 percent all in on this type of vehicle um, and you know it can start to become efficient when you have portfolios of a million dollars plus because the administrative and you know legal valuation fees you know at that point are far outweighed by the benefit you get by using less of your um you know your gift tax um, and your, your lifetime uh, numbers what is key in terms of driving the discounts up and making this more efficient well from a valuation perspective we would look at okay there's a lower likelihood of um, distributions perhaps the entity hasn't paid distributions historically or um, there's a commitment going forward not to pay distributions uh, it could be that there's very difficulties in transferring the units. So the operating agreement may be set up in a way to restrict the ability of Julie, who now owns 30%, to sell that to anybody else. She may only be able to um, pass it across to a permitted transferee, somebody else in the family group. And in terms of what Empire can do with that information, it again drives the discount up and gives Naomi the ability um, to you know, transfer this wealth more efficiently. Then um, I guess why, why a sense of urgency around this? I think we, we chatted a little bit about, hey, Phantom's Nest, this is really an opportune time for um, those guys to do the transfer before the business takes off a um, lot of other factors but that's the main one with the llc discounts um you know mitch you know uh gave empire kind of uh, a brief reference earlier on with respect to you know this topic um and we are grateful at this point that the the version of the bill that uh, was circulated in late October, uh, early November, 
does not include the language that prohibits um, discounts on non-business assets. But you know, in septem a September version of the Ways and Means Committee, um, uh, you know, publications, it was clear that they they wanted at that point that when a taxpayer transfers non-business assets, those assets should not be afforded a valuation discount for tax transfer purposes. So those discounts that we, we talked about, there has been effort by the Democrats to get rid of them. Now in, and, and during October, they, they were written out of the latest bill that's um, moving through, um, moving through the, the House and then eventually the Senate. But it's, it's not clear uh, to Lee's point um, whether it will make it back in. So if you have clients who are, who may benefit from this type of strategy, there is a sense of urgency because um, it, 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 this could make it back in and that uh, it could, for like a $2 million portfolio, mean that you're going from um, using, you know, 1.4 million um, of the, you know, lifetime credit or exemption to the full 2 million. So, you know, a potentially big swing factor if, if the likelihood is that that person will pay um, taxes on their estate down the, down the road. Uh, Lou, how many minutes do I have left? You have four minutes left. Oh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> um, so, um, that, that's probably, in terms of the urgency of implementing this strategy, um, that's probably the main point to take to your, to your clients when you're thinking about, hey, should I recommend this to folks this year or should it wait till next year? Um, th there's just a, a risk that for these non-business assets, um, which I can talk a little bit more about, um, it being like marketable securities, um, perhaps pr interest in private equity funds or hedge funds, et cetera, there's a real risk that what, you know, Empire with the help of, you know, the attorney structuring the documents has been able to put together for the client historically has been, you know, a package with a 30 or 35% all in discount. And that could just be yanked away from, you know, our community uh, uh, as an estate and wealth training wealth transfer tactic. Uh, so, um, any, any questions? We have, do we have the mics? Right here, Tim. Gentleman right there. Is there any case law in <laughs> regard to the IRS challenging transfer of marketable securities into an LLC and then taking the discounts? Um, there is case law, I'll probably throw that to, to the attorneys. I think when it's structured properly, it's, it has stood up to challenges. Um, are there particular examples that, that you guys? Well, I'm, I'm gonna start by saying that the original Build Back Better Act um, that was floating around up until about two weeks ago, the ability, to, the ability to take those discounts was going to be taken away by that act. So um, it's not in the act that is floating around at the moment. Um, so if it's properly structured, it's still a viable option. Yeah. So if you reverse engineer that thinking, if they had it in legislation, that means that it's allowable without the legislation. And that's the whole theory on all of these green book changes. If they weren't in the green book, the, the Congress wouldn't have to act. And so the things that we're doing and the things that we're using that they are targeting, including the beat it, which is in the green book, require legislation in order to disallow. This brings us back to dot your I's, cross your T's, have a good business attorney or corporate attorney who is gonna maintain the minutes of the entity, who's gonna have meetings on an annual basis, because on audit, and this is where, uh, to borrow an old commercial cliche, where the rubber meets the road, when you file your 709 and you get that audit letter or examination letter, you better have someone like Empire at your side. 
and Daniel to sit there and say, okay, here is why we valued it like we did, and here is the operating agreement that Teresa drafted with all of the restrictions that are real restrictions in a real document being enforced, and that's what gives it the credibility. If you do that, these discounts still exist. Um, you go to Heckerling every year, there's an attorney by the name of Steve Porter, if you've been to Heckerling, and every year, Steve, he litigates most of the valuation cases in the country, and he lectures on this and gives you the state of affairs, and right now, if you, if you do the work properly, you should be able to benefit from the discounts, whether it's an active business or passive investments, prop, provided the LLC is structured properly. Um, one of the questions that I have is, what, what kind of activity level are you seeing from the IRS? Anybody try to call the IRS lately? <laughs> the phone is gonna ring for eight hours and you're not gonna get an answer. Uh, I had a case where, <laughs> yeah. They'll find you find something else to do, a crossword puzzle or something. But I had a case where we actually filed an estate tax return, and the client wrote a check to the IRS for twelve point three million dollars of estate tax, federal estate tax. We mail the check in, we send it in with the return. We get a cashed check back, and then the client started to receive notices for deficiency on $12.3 million with penalties and interest running. And we called, we wrote, we wrote letters, we wrote emails. The only thing I could do to get their attention is I actually had to file an appeal. And about a week after I filed the appeal, they called up and said, oh, sorry. Yeah, we got the check. Kansas City office had it, and we had to cancel check back with the deposit. So how active are they right now? We've been seeing you know, an uptick on the very large estates. Um, I, I mean, I think some of, some of the partners I, I work with closely, um, you know, the, where they maybe got like, I don't know, three, 400 entities that they will earmark those, like really the giants mm -hmm. for like, for very um, close attention. I still think they're understaffed um, from a, you know, valuation engineer perspective yep. to look into um, look into things. It will be interesting to see how much of the, the funding for additional enforcement gets channeled down into you know valuation enforcement um, in particular. In one of the bills, it's they want to hire eighty seven thousand new agents for the IRS, uh, and you know, we have plenty of laws that could collect <coughs> lots of tax, but there is very little enforcement right now, and I think that's, that's really one of the major problems. Um, and, and what's that? It's an opportunity, but for how long? I, I, <laughs> so haven't, if I haven't seen a full-fledged audit in years. I mean, I've seen desk audits where, you know, they, they sent you a letter and you've had to provide information. And actually the last one that I had was one where I had to send, I think, 10 um, valuations from Empire Valuation <laughs> to back it up. And um, I handed them all in and they, the next thing we knew, we got the closing letter. Yep. And, and, and to give you an idea of how long ago that was, that was back when they actually issued closing letters without requesting them. You, you'll like this one, Karen, because I, I was involved in a, an audit associated with music royalties. So it was intellectual property. And we, I'm not sure exactly why it got flagged, but we went through the valuation engineer and I think they changed the discount like 10 basis points. So the overall value of the estate may have gone up, I don't know, 1% or something, but it, it, I'm seeing them flag things, but then when it gets to the people who actually know the nuts and bolts, not that much changes. Um, but it, it just takes forever. Yeah. yeah, and you want to get that no change letter, and, and that's the freedom for your clients. Yeah. Uh, I want to bring our next speaker up. On a, on a little aside, by the way, because this is something I've been looking into over the last six, six months or so, since all our elderly musicians have been out there selling their catalogs, there aren't even going to be those audits. Great point. <laughs> so I, while, while Peter comes up, are you speaking from there or up here? Uh, I'll 
thin so I can see the slides. So while Peter's getting his microphone on, I just want to point out one thing that, that we've experienced recently, and that is as we're now finding clients that want to go up to that 11.7 and use as much of the 11.7 as you can, make sure that you review prior transactions. Because if you have something like a life insurance trust and you're making premiums and you're do, using crummy powers, you're not using any of the gift tax exemption. So you're going to have the full 11.7 of gift tax exemption, but you have to allocate to those generation skipping transfer tax exemption because there is no annual exclusion. So you end up with less GST exemption than you have gift tax exemption, which means that if you go all the way to the $11.7 million line, your contribution to that trust is going to be a GST taxable event. And so just be aware, make sure you look at all of the client's prior transactions before you engage in that major gift and get close to that $11.7 million line.